if what you're thinking of is what Cornell was like when it was founded, all these other schools have had to change and evolve, but what modern higher education today, Cornell was really a pioneer in what we think of for, for modern higher education degrees. Uh, some of these schools did have sister schools, so Columbia had Barnard, Harvard had Radcliffe, uh, but these institutions were not fully coeducational until the 60s and 70s for the most part. So Cornell became a role model, really led the way for, for other institutions in terms of admitting women and men together. Uh, there were all sorts of you know, worries about this. The colonel himself briefly attended Cornell. Uh, when he opened the first KFC, he decided to come take a restaurant management course at the hotel school, uh, a special eight-week course to teach him how to run a restaurant. So Colonel Sanders was a special student for a while. And then there was a McDonald's employee who was vice president of aquatic development who invented the filet fish the quarter pounder with cheese, and the McDonald's apple pie. Uh, so really, the obesity epidemic in America can be traced back to Cornell University. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of influence in fast food. But it really ties in nicely with Cornell history, because if you go to Ezra Cornell's birthplace in the Bronx, this is what is located at Ezra's birthplace. There is a McDonald's there on the corner where Ezra was born. Uh, the McDonald's was not there when Ezra was born in 1807. But. That is the location Ezra was born. So if any of you have ever been to that McDonald's in the Bronx, you can think of Ezra Cornell. There's no plaque or anything there. All the other big football schools had animal mascots, but Cornell doesn't have one, but just the big red. Uh, and, and so they got jealous of other schools and went out and bought a bear cub. <laughs> <laughs> they named the bear cub Touchdown, and the bear cub would travel with them by train to various away games. It would stay in hotels with them and go on adventures with the football team. And there are lots of stories of the bear getting loose and terrorizing people in hotel lobbies. <laughs> the bear would climb out, uh, climb the, the goalposts at halftime of football games and entertain the crowds. And by the end of the season, the bear cub was no longer a bear cub, and so the, the bears never lasted more than one season. But there were four different live bears over the years. Touchdown one, two, three, and four. <laughs> And the first one was 1915, which happened to be the first year that Cornell was named national champion in football. Pumpkin showed up in 1997 in October, a few weeks before Halloween, and it has become one of the greatest Cornell histories in Franks in history. Uh, and it's a pretty fascinating story that the New York Times was all over this. Uh, conundrum at Cornell, Pumpkin's lofty perch. So this caught like national media attention when it happened back in 1997. And you had all the major networks sending reporters here and covering the pumpkin and interviewing students. And it became this like media extravaganza at Cornell over the pumpkin. And the New York Times basically assigns a beat reporter to the pumpkin. And over the next few weeks, uh, regular stories, Cornell waits for pumpkin to plummet. So they're like, all right, I guess it'll fall down. Cornell put police tape around the clock tower because they were worried it might fall and injure someone. So they're like, all right, well, we'll put police tape around it and wait for it to fall and it'll all be good. Next article, it's now uh, December, Cornell's pumpkin pop is another mystery. <laughs> like, well, maybe it's a plastic pumpkin, maybe it's not gonna fall. Maybe, you know, maybe it's not a, a real pumpkin, it's tough to tell from down here. And this is before the era of drones and, and things like that. Another article, let's see, it's now February. <laughs> <laughs> Cornell wants to know, pumpkin or plastic? And so people are still baffled by the pumpkin. The New York Times still thinks this is newsworthy and running stories on it. Uh, and, and everyone at Cornell is very confused. And there are beginning to be competitions where engineers are trying to design things. They could fly up and take a photo of the pumpkin or a sample of it. You know, physics students are calculating, well, do you have a catapult? Do you launch the pumpkin on top? Or how does that work? The plant science students are trying to figure out what type of pumpkin it is. <laughs> And then we get into March 11th. Cornell plans to rescue pumpkin scotch. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't just leave the pumpkin here forever. It's been five, six months at this point. We gotta do something. So Cornell brings in a big crane and they decide they're gonna have a big party on the art squad to celebrate taking the pumpkin down. The Cornell Dairy makes clock tower pumpkin ice cream, which they still serve pumpkin ice cream every fall ever since the, the pumpkin in 1997. Uh, so there's this big party plan. They bring in a crane. And they, they go up and do a test run with the crane that morning to make sure all is working and okay. And uh, the final word here, pumpkin and hoopla at Cornell go splat. A, a gust of wind hit the crane into the clock tower during their test run and knocked the pumpkin off. And uh, it fell onto some scaffolding because the, the clock tower was having some repairs done. And so this happened before the big event and kind of ruined their big party. I think they still have the party anyway. But. 
it was this very strange bit of, of Cornell history here. Uh, the final word actually was the New York Times concluded with Cornell panel determines object really is. <laughs> 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 and the button afterwards and made sure, yes, it is indeed a pumpkin. And here's a close up of the pumpkin kind of rotting. Uh, and what they figured out was that they expected it to fall a lot sooner because they figured it would rot pretty quickly, but it basically freeze dried in the Ithaca winter. It was just this like hardened, dried out husk of a pumpkin. On uh, the 10 year anniversary, they, they got it out. Uh, it was basically a jar of mush at this point because they'd added it to the Cornell Drain collection. Uh, so as of 2007, there wasn't much pumpkin left though. I, I believe they still have that jar of goo in the basement of this building with some of the leftover brains that aren't on display in the brain collection. Uh, so we still have that. But the, the pumpkin perpetrator or the pumpkin prankster has never come forward. It remains one of the greatest mysteries that, that no one has ever admitted to be the, the pumpkin prankster. Uh, but they have given anonymous interviews to various people about how it was done. And so the, the most accepted version of how it was done was that they went up for the evening Shines concert. Make sure you go to a Shines concert if you haven't been to one yet. Uh, some people graduate and they've never gone up to the top of the clock tower, so make sure you do that. But this person hid amongst the chimes while they were playing, and then waited for the chimes master to go home. And they taped over the lock of the door, went home, got climbing equipment, they were a professional climber, and they scaled the roof of the clock tower. There was a little trap door halfway up the roof that they cut through a padlock with bolt cutters. They had come prepared, clearly scoped it out, climbed up the roof, and actually, if you look at the roof in this image, yeah, this image here, you can kind of see the ridges are pretty deep, so apparently it was relatively easy for them to scale the roof with the climbing equipment. They hollowed out the pumpkin uh, so it was easier to carry, and they put the pumpkin on top, and then that was that. Uh, but they have kept their identity a uh, mystery all these years later. So maybe for the 21st anniversary in 2022, they could find out who the pumpkin prankster was.